Now it's time for Lefties Losing It and we can't go too long on this program without some input from the ladies of The View. Here is some awful advice from Joy Behar. Not just awful, but full of lies. I would say to those Republicans out there who are sitting on the fence, just do it this one time. Do it this one time. Vote for the Democrat this, to save the country. Listen to right. Liz Cheney. When everything goes back to normal, then become a Republican again, like like Alyssa will become, and probably I'm I'm <laughs> Listen to Liz Cheney. That's their big sell. So Joy wants Republicans to not back Trump, not back their man in the most consequential election of their lifetime. And she promises that it'll all be back to normal after this, that they won't go on these unhinged attacks against future Republican candidates. Only I'm old enough to remember when they called milquetoast Mitt Romney a racist, sexist monster. They did the same with Rhino John McCain. They've been doing the same with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and... You know they're going to double down when he's the presidential candidate. So thanks for the advice, Joy, but I reckon Republicans are not going to let unhinged far-left fried bats pick their candidates for them. As for listening to Liz Cheney, a reminder that Republicans dumped her and comprehensively, as you can see there, she's about as popular with Republicans as an Antifa activist. Now to a woman who may even be too crazy for the view, and that's saying something. Here is Democrat strategist Aisha Mills resorting to dangerous lies about President Trump and despite two assassination attempts in two months against Donald Trump, CNN saw fit to put this dangerous lefty spouting reckless lies on television. We have long known that Donald Trump has revered uh, the Nazis. He has revered Hitler. He's read his book. He used to say he had it on his nightstand. Say so what now? Donald Trump reveres Hitler? He said he has Hitler's book on his nightstand. Trump has never said anything like that. He has, in fact, said he's never even read Hitler's book. And let's not forget, Trump is the most pro-Jewish, most pro-Israel president America has ever had. His own daughter is Jewish, as are several of his grandchildren. But let's go back to CNN and listen to this woman spew more unhinged lies, unchallenged. Donald Trump has had a very sinister philosophy, um, wanting to be a dictator, uh, absolutely dividing people up based on who they are, based on factors about them that have to do with their race and their gender, etc. And when he uses language like this, I don't think that it's a Freudian slip. I think that the danger of a Donald Trump is that he would absolutely try to uh, exterminate an entire group of people because he thinks that their genes are somehow different than his and faulty. And I say this with all the sternness that you hear in my voice. Exterminate a whole group of people. That was on CNN, folks. Um, lost for words. Now, since we're dealing with bold-faced lies, let's hear from Kamala herself and listen to how she flounders when there is the slightest bit of pushback. The question was, how are you going to pay for it? Well, one of the things is I'm going to make sure that the richest among us who can afford it pay their fair share in taxes. It is not right that teachers and nurses and firefighters are paying a higher tax rate than billionaires and the biggest corporations. But, and but, I plan on making that fair. Say what now? Teachers are paying higher tax rates than the super rich? Really? I know this type of simplistic class warfare speaks to the low information voters that the Democrats count on, but the reality is that the rich pay obviously a lot more tax. The top 1%, in fact, pay over 45% of all income tax. And the top 5% pay 65.6% of all income tax collected. That's from the uh, 2021 IRS data. So I'm sure they know what they're talking about. Imagine how Kamala would go in a hostile interview. She can't even cope at her own rally when the teleprompter appears to malfunction momentarily. So 32 days, 32 days. Okay, we got some business to do. We got some business to do. All right. 
32 days. And we know we will do it. Amazing stuff from her. Far worse than what we saw from Selena Meyer when she faced a similar conundrum. My fellow Americans, I'd like to begin today Whatever we have in store cannot be known. But given time, it, it, it can be understood. The past was once the future. The future is, I should say, unknown. Now, the Veep, the real one, did go to the Call Her Daddy podcast, incredibly, where she faced idiotic softball questions, lots of uh, misinformation about abortion, there wasn't much else there. But when she was asked about why she should be trusted, she had this to say. Why should we trust you? So I'll say this. Look, you can look at my career to know what I care about. OK, let's do just that. Here is a little of Kamala Harris telling us what she's all about. You know, for far too long, the status quo thinking has been to believe that by putting more police on the street, you're going to have more safety. And that's just wrong. You're considered the most liberal United States senator. I, I Somebody said that, and it actually was Mike Pence on the debate stage. But <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, that nonpartisan GovTrack has rated you as the most liberal senator. You supported the Green New Deal. You supported Medicare for all. And yeah, I am a radical. <laughs> if they fail to act as president of the United States, I am prepared to get rid of the filibuster to pass a Green New Deal. I am supporting the Green New Deal. Raise your hand if, gover if your government plan would provide coverage for undocumented immigrants. The idea that we would have a president of the United States that vilifies immigrants, that wants to build what I call his vanity project, a multi-billion dollar wall, which, by the way, will never get built. Because we have a president of the United States who has created a fiction about a crisis at the border around his vanity project called the wall. We don't need to build a wall. And by definition, just plain speak, basic English language definition, it is not an emergency is about a vanity project for this president. That's, that wall ain't gonna stop them. No. 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 I think I understand now why someone went to the trouble of writing this book called The Achievements of Kamala Harris. Wait for it. In less time at Kidding me. Plenty more lefties losing it content with my next guest, including more on Kamala's Car Crash 60 Minutes interview. But let's hear now from a man who says he has gone from being a lifelong Democrat to voting for Donald Trump. Let's hear why. Bradley, tell us why you're making the change from the Democrat ticket to President Trump. Mr. Trump stated, I'm going to build a wall because I want the people that live here to eat first. Since this new administration has come to the table, my children are lacking. My community is lacking. I see abandoned properties, folks laying on the street. And forgive me, why do we feed folk when we have folks who went overseas, hung, bled, and died in the service of this country, and they're laying on the streets? That's unacceptable. Absolutely. If you can house an immigrant with all due respect house my children first these are the people that fought for us they're laying on the street they can't get medical assistance because you've given it to someone else they closed down schools they opened the schools to put migrants in mm -hmm. you can open a school and put my veterans in there Amen. you can open a school and put my homeless children in there but yet you refuse to feed those that state that they are here right. they've been here you've overlooked us Joining me now is Newsweek Senior Editor at Large and Article 3 Project Senior Counsel Josh Hammer. Josh, they're powerful words right there, but how widespread is that sentiment? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not just this particular gentleman. I mean, just over the past 24 hours, we actually saw a 
a former longtime Democratic congressman by the name of Peter Deutsch, who in an op-ed explained that he is now endorsing Donald Trump as well. We, we have now seen RFK Jr., who comes from maybe the most famous Democratic family in all of American politics, the Kennedy family, quite literally as famous as it gets. He is going all in for Donald Trump. Tulsi Gabbard, who, who, who ran for president as a Democrat the last cycle in 2020, she is now all in for, for Donald Trump. Look, anecdotally, I can say basically everyone that I know in my family who is not a crazy lefty, who is at least a reasonable, pragmatic, centrist, moderate-minded person, they're basically all voting for Donald Trump, too. You know, America's civilizational stakes right now, Rita, are, are actually very simple and straightforward. On the one hand, you have the forces of civilizational arson, as I call it. These are the forces of open borders madness who are just opening the floodgates to God knows how many and of what types of migrants from all over the third world we, we have led in Tajiki nationals with ties to ISIS. I mean, I could go on and on there. I, it, these are the people that are that are supporting sexual mutilation, so-called gender affirming care for minors, oftentimes saying that teachers can and ought to do so outside of the purview of the parents' own right to actually raise their own children. So surreptitiously trying to trans the kids essentially in schools. And then you have the forces of civilizational sanity. That ultimately really is what the Trump man's ticket represents, I think. It's not a crazy far-right authoritarian fascist movement. Ultimately, at the end of the day, Donald Trump's MAGA movement is really just about good old-fashioned common sense, which really which I think is why you're seeing people like this gentleman we just saw who are now coming around to openly supporting him. And that sentiment about uh, the Biden-Harris administration uh, failing Americans uh, uh, seems to be spreading if the latest poly market data is any guide. Uh, Kamala Harris has gone from leading to now Trump is leading and that lead is extending, uh, particularly in recent days. Uh, uh, we see a lot of polls, Josh. It can be hard to uh, rely on that data because they do change a lot. Tell me how significant this data is. You know, I, I, I think Donald Trump's going to win. I, I, I do. I've been saying it the whole cycle. I, I have not wavered really at all. I mean, Donald Trump back in July was looking really, really good. So he had that, that few week stretch after the catastrophic Biden debate. There was the assassination attempt where he came within inches of, of losing his life on, on national TV, where all the world's sympathy was with him. He reached a high watermark then. Now, admittedly, the Trump campaign did not pivot as swiftly as it should have to the bloodless coup of Joe Biden for Kamala Harris. And then Kamala Harris got a, a long period, a slow rollout. She had the convention. She had probably about a three to four week rollout. And that was her high watermark. And personally, I was never freaking out as, as many of my fellow conservative commentators were because I thought that the fundamentals at the end of the day still militate strongly in favor of Republicans this cycle. Namely, when you look at what the American people say about the big four issues that are going to dictate this election, the, the economy, inflation, immigration, and crime, the American people trust Republicans way, way, way more than Democrats. Right now, roughly 28% of Americans, last time I checked the, the, the big poll, said that America is on the right track. That is a catastrophically low number. Mm. An incumbent party is not going to win a re-election in a situation like that where the public thinks that we're heading straight into abyss, which, by the way, I think we kind of are, unless things change fairly drastically here. So I, I do think that Donald Trump is going to win. I do not think that pollsters ha have fixed their structural methodological flaws for the 2016 and 2020 elections. I I'm not going to say that I'm confident on it. I wouldn't bet the ranch on it, but I do certainly think that Donald Trump at this point is more likely than not to win this election. Well, you've got more uh, faith in the system than I do. I just do fear that uh, uh, they're going to fortify another election. Certainly the media has done everything it can to uh, swing uh, the odds in Kamala Harris's favour. That campaign by the media, and I talk about the bulk of the mainstream media here, has been astonishing. I haven't seen anything like it before. Uh, Harris has copped, I've got to say, some criticism for appearing on the podcast, a fairly raunchy podcast called Call Her Daddy. We talked about it last night. This podcast typically features all sorts of talk about uh, sexual uh, acts, graphic uh, uh, descriptions of such sexual acts and, uh, and other things as well. Uh, 
she's been accused of just essentially preaching to the choir. People saying, well, the demographics of the, that podcast, though it's got a decent sized audience, are likely to be Democrat voters anyway. Is that how you see it or was it a clever move by her to get on these platforms that perhaps don't hear from candidates too often? I, if you're looking to persuade someone who's not going to vote for you already, then a Democratic candidate who is a rabid supporter of abortion going on in the, the Call Her Daddy podcast is, is not exactly a way to persuade over the persuadable middle. You, you're certainly not going to win over you, you know, blue-collar union workers in the Marcellus Shale of Western Pennsylvania or the auto workers in Wisconsin or Michigan. You're not going to win over those kind of folks going on the Call Her Daddy podcast. You're not going to win over the folks on the border in, in Arizona or, or the folks who, who are being mm. besieged by, by urban crime in Atlanta and Fulton County, Georgia. You, these are not the people that you're going to win over. She's doing this for one reason, Rita, and one reason only, which is to talk about the abortion issue, because that is currently the, the only issue that a non-negligible percentage of Americans say that they care about at the polls, and that of those issues, that is the only one they say they trust Democrats more on. So she's trying to shift the terrain of this election election away from the issues that we just discussed, away from the inflation economy, immigration and crime, which are the big four issues. She's trying to switch it away from that to abortion. That's why she's going on this, this podcast that you accurately described as raunchy, a podcast where I believe the episode directly before she went on literally had a, a sexual act in the title that I am not going to discuss on, on this show out of respect for the viewers there. But, but, but this is not the kind of show that someone who wants to be the leader of the free world ought to go on. I, I mean, it, it is belittling of herself, I think, to give this this woman and this platform airtime, frankly. But, you know, is she ever going to sit down for for any, I mean, I mean, not a hostile interview. Is she going to sit down for a single real interview and actually answer real questions? So far, we've gotten Stephanie Rule on MSNBC. She still flubbed that one. And then she's given us Alex Cooper on the Call Her Daddy Sexual Act Glorification podcast. I mean, are, are, are we running for leader of the free world or trying to get on the cover of Playboy magazine? I mean, sometimes the mind just reels. Well, we played a little clip from Call Her Daddy, a previous episode uh, on last night's show, and we had to bleep out approximately 70 to 80 percent of it. It was that filthy. I'm not suggesting it's like that every week. I don't know. I've never heard it. But uh, certainly some of the content they have covered, wow, it's, it's incredible that her team thought that was a good idea. You think you should go on something like Joe Rogan. If she wants to reach a mass audience of diverse people who uh, uh, listen to podcasts, that would be your number one choice, I would have thought. Now, let's take a look at some of her work on 60 Minutes. Uh, she struggled to show support for Israeli PM Benjamin Netanyahu. Do we have a, a, a real close ally in Prime Minister Netanyahu? I think... With all due respect, the better question is, do we have an important alliance between the American people and the Israeli people? And the answer to that question is yes. And then she gave this incoherent answer on that same topic. But it seems that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is not listening. Well, Bill, the work that we have done has resulted in a number of movements in that region by Israel that were very much prompted by or a result of uh, many things, including our advocacy for what needs to happen in the region. OK, uh, Josh, what do you make of what you've just heard? You know, some people are calling this a word salad, Rita. The problem is that a salad can at times be quite delicious. I mean, th this is more closely analogous to, to a word turd sandwich, frankly. I, that is how I would I would prefer to, just, to, to describe this. You know, Rita, I'm coming to you. I actually came straight from an event that President Trump did on October 7th, I, I came straight from Trump National Doral, his, his golf resort in South Florida. He, 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 he hit a grand slam home run. This was an event that Trump did earlier today here in the United States, talking to a predominantly Jewish room, although there were certainly Christian supporters of Israel there as well. 
He gave a fantastic speech where he solemnly vowed to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Jewish people and the Jewish state of Israel. He said, you will never, ever, ever have jihad or the threat of another Holocaust on my watch. This never would have happened under my watch. He said all the right things, and he means it. He actually actually visited He visited the Ohel. He visited the gravesite of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson. May his memory be a blessing. One of the greatest Jewish sages of the 20th century. He was there earlier on Monday with Ben Shapiro up in New York City visiting this gravesite. I mean, th- th- this is a man who, who whose natural sympathies for the broader Judeo-Christian inheritance that makes Western civilization cannot be doubted. You compare that to, to what we just heard there. I, I mean, how do you even compare that? I mean, Donald Trump is going to the Lubavitcher Rebbe's grave in New York City, and, and she's pl- planting a tree at, at her place in Washington, D.C., D. and Tim Walls is sitting down with Stephen Colbert. I, I, I mean, you simply just cannot compare these two things. Final point, just real quick, you, you know, it, come Kamala Harris, right there in that response, tries to do something that a lot of Democrats do, which is to say, oh, I stand with Israel, just not with Benjamin Netanyahu and the Netanyahu government. Total baloney. Benjamin Netanyahu speaks for the Israeli people when it comes to his announced war aims of eradicating Hamas and returning the hostages, which have been his two war aims for a year now. Something like 80% of Israelis agree with those two war aims. So this this purported divide between Netanyahu and the Israeli people, it's a false divide. You either stand with both or you stand with neither. Yeah, her refusal to to even try to answer that question, she immediately reframed the question to something she was comfortable answering, I think, uh, speaks volumes. Uh, Just on uh, Elon Musk quickly, he's sat down for a wide-ranging interview with Tucker Carlson, but he was also with Donald Trump in Butler uh, for that rally where Trump uh, returned to the site of the first assassination attempt. He has really energized the Trump base, Elon Musk. Yeah, he really has. And, and huge credit to Elon Musk. You know, it's funny, with with Elon Musk, who is quite literally the wealthiest man in the world, J.D. Vance, who went to Yale Law School, Donald Trump's an Ivy League man himself, went to UPenn. What you're starting to see emerge on the Republican side of the aisle here in the United States is what my friend Chris Rufo has quite artfully termed a, a counter-elite. You know, uh, we conservatives despise the current American ruling class, which is deeply hostile to we our do, interests. Josh, in- we are going to have to talk about the counter-elite next week because I think that is actually a very interesting phenomenon indeed. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much.